spoke with my pal Bill Brown this week, and we decided that we're going to do a three-part sermon series. He's going to back clean up. He's going to be the one that gets the walk-off home run at the end of this series. We're going to talk about faith this week, hope next week, and he gets love the last week. And that's the week of uh, his anniversary, I think, so he wants to read the passage that they read at his wedding. He's a big, mush, mushy guy. But um, faith, huh? Is faith best measured by people who are faithful to God or by people who lack faith in God? Is it easier to understand that way? Let's go back to read the first line of what Toby read for you, the first line of the 11th chapter of the letter to the Hebrews. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And we get the laundry list of people who were faithful in spite of great obstacles. People who were faithful, didn't matter what was coming at them, they were faithful. Noah is told to build a boat, not just a boat, a big boat, not just a big boat, a huge ship, and fill it with animals. From a voice that he heard from the sky coming to him, not necessarily anyone that he recognized, because if you remember the story of Noah near the beginning of creation, it was not a voice that had been heard for a while. And imagine his neighbors watching him build this. Imagine their laughter and imagine his family when he said, get on board, and they did. And humanity was spared through that story. Imagine the faith of Abraham. And I gotta read this line again, because I just love this. I love this. Abraham, who is called, he's retired. He's worked hard all his days. Again, at a time when God's voice hadn't been heard for a while. Abraham is sitting on the porch looking out over all that he has earned. He's there resting with his wife. They're what we call up in years, not spring chickens by any stretch of the imagination. And what is it that we say about him? Even though he was too old and Sarah herself was barren because he considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one person and this one as good as dead, many descendants were born. What would you do if you were retired and finally got a chance to relax and a voice comes to you and says, Abram, get up and go. Go where? Go where I'm telling you. You're going to be a father. Are you kidding me, Lord? That's a paraphrase, but that really is what he's saying. Are you kidding me? But he goes. What about Moses? And the people who followed Moses, think Moses got to talk to God directly. The people had to take Moses' word for it, didn't they? And he said, okay, we're going to go. We're going to leave Egypt. We're going to hit the highway. And suddenly they're at the water's edge, and behind them come the chariots with the spears and the swords, and they look up, and they... Moses raises the staff and says, all right, and the waters part and says, follow me. I don't know that I would have gone, to be honest. But all these were faithful, even though they did not live to see the promise. Now, the disciples are in the boat with the very promise, aren't they? And we have other accounts of Jesus on the water with the disciples. The storm comes up at sea. Jesus has just fed a crowd. He is fed people with a little bit of food. We talked about that for Vacation Bible School again this year, that big miracle story, that sign that's the only one that appears in all four Gospels because it's such a big, powerful story of who God is. And he's just done that, and the disciples go on the boat ahead of him, and a storm comes up at sea, and he walks to them on the water, and they look up, and instead of saying, oh, it must be Jesus because he can do anything, they say, ah, it's a ghost, it's a ghost, it's a ghost. And another account of this story, when Peter is in the boat and he says if it's really you lord tell me to walk to you and jesus said okay come on peter gets out of the boat i don't know that i would have had that kind of faith but he gets out of the boat takes a few steps and then decides people are not supposed to walk on water and begins to sink if you go into my office you can see a painting of that event i look at it every day that i sit at my desk especially at moments when my boat starts to rock a little bit with the storm because it is Jesus looking down and smiling as he pulls Peter up through the water. It's Peter's view of Jesus. Now, the epistle to the Hebrews, we don't know who wrote it. We're not even sure exactly when it was written. It was written in the latter half of the first century. When people were feeling persecuted, when they were feeling put down, when they were feeling unsure and unsteady, because Jesus, they thought, was going to be back imminently. He had died, he was raised, and things just got worse and worse for the people, but they kept thinking he's going to be back any moment, any moment, any moment. And when that moment became the next moment, became the next moment, became the next moment. 
they started to lose heart. They started to fall away from worship. They started to feel persecuted because they were persecuted by the Romans and also by the Jewish community that had not accepted Jesus as the Messiah. They were feeling put down and hurt, disappointed, let down by God, thinking what will ever go our way ever again? Kind of like 2021, which I refer to as the nasty little brother of 2020. So what do we do when our boats are rocking? What do we do when we don't know what's coming at us next and don't know how to handle it? What do we do when we're at disagreement and at odds with what to do, especially in the pandemic? Masking came up at a good time this week for this passage to be read. Because where do we put our faith? People have said to me, who can I believe? Can I believe the CDC? Can I believe the naysayers? Can I believe my political stance? Can I believe science? Can I trust God? How do I trust God in the midst of all this chaos and craziness? It's a tough time to walk the walk of a disciple, isn't it? Years ago, I had a man come to me and say, you're going to do my granddaughter's wedding. Not, will you do my granddaughter's wedding? He said, you're going to do my granddaughter's wedding. Why? Because he was a millionaire. He let me know that all the time. I could buy and sell everybody in this church. You love but when people open with that, you know. He said, she's crazy, and the guy she's marrying is crazy. They're kind of hippies. He said, but you're going to marry him. They're not people of faith, but you're going to marry him anyway. And I said, i got to meet with them first. He said, oh, no, you're going to meet with them, but you're going to marry them. I met with them. They were a lovely young couple. And to quote another pastor friend of mine, I wouldn't give you a nickel for them being married for more than a couple of weeks because they had no clue what they were doing. They got married in the woods, which is okay. God made the woods. I'm not saying God only lives inside the buildings with the steeple on top. He had on a leather vest and no shirt under it, most of which was covered by his hair and his beard. She had no shoes. She had lace tied through her toes and up her legs. And they tripped down the path, not the aisle, to a Grateful Dead tune. Not one very conducive to a Christian wedding. They said, we don't want any of that religious stuff. I said, if I'm here, it's that religious stuff. And it rained the day of their wedding. And everyone was gathered in the woods and trying to huddle under this one little pavilion out in the woods. And she said, we can't get married today. It's a bad omen. It's a bad omen. It's a bad omen. It's bad luck. Bad luck to get married. I said, we are people of faith. We are not people of fate. And she said, no, no, no. This is bad luck. We can't get married. We've got to call it all off. And her grandfather said, I cooked a pig for this. We're getting married today. And I stood up at the beginning of their wedding and I sang a song that I tried to find the music for today, but it is so long out of print. It's by Miriam Therese Winter, who was one of the singing nuns, the Sisters of Mercy back in the 60s. I saw raindrops on my window. Joy is like the rain. Laughter runs across my pain, slips away and comes again. Joy is like the rain. I saw Christ in wind and thunder, joy is tried by storm. Christ asleep within my boat, whipped by wind yet still afloat, joy is tried by storm. Now, it had nothing to do with me singing that. It did calm her down a little bit. But 20 years later, I got a call. I was serving another church. I was in West Virginia at the time, and she said, my name is such and such, do you remember me? I have to understand I've done a lot of weddings in 36 years of ministry, a lot of weddings. People will walk to me in the grocery store sometimes and say, excuse me, did you marry me? I say to them, no, I married my husband. I may have performed your wedding. And she said, my name is so-and-so. And I said, okay. And she said, you did my wedding years ago. And she said, my grandfather wasn't. I knew his name, boy. He could have bought and sold me. She said, we would like you to reaffirm our vows for our 20th anniversary. And they came to my office, and he was an accountant. He'd gotten his CPA, he had his hair cut, thick glasses, a three-piece suit, and she was wearing a dress, had shoes on her feet, and said, we're Seventh-day Adventists now. I said, get out of here. <laughs> she said, yeah, we're vegetarians, we're in church all the time, but we need to reaffirm our vows now that we know what we're doing in God's name wasn't because I sang them a song at their wedding. It was because Christ was present at their wedding. Did you notice that when we were talking about Moses here, what does it say? 
about Moses. He considered abuse suffered for the Christ to be greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt. For he was looking ahead to the reward. To understand Hebrews, you've got to go back to the first line of Hebrews that says in chapter 1 that Jesus Christ, the very imprint of God, has been present through all of creation. This is a book that we call a book of high Christology, that Christ is above all, before all, in all, through all. And how chapter 12 begins is, then if we are surrounded by so great a crowd of witnesses, let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus Christ, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, the beginning and the end of our faith, the one who brought faith into being, the one who is present with God in the creation of the world, and also the one who brings faith to completion. That's how you get through your boat rocking in a storm. And my boat has been rocked lately. How's yours? I don't give the disciples such a hard time because even though they should have known if Jesus is sleeping in the boat, there's nothing to worry about, but at least they knew who to wake up when they got scared, right? So what I'd like you to do this week is to either keep reading this chapter 11 because sometimes we need to remind ourselves, don't we, of the power of faith. And we have faith in a God who is faithful to us. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not. Thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. And then look to your own crowd of witnesses, your own cloud of witnesses, those people in your life who informed your faith, who taught you the faith, who persevered no matter what happened because they are all around us. For me, Dr. Larry Stuckey, who taught me worship theology and sacramental theology, Dr. Joseph C. Weber, who taught me about the New Testament, who died while I was still a student at Wesley Seminary, Dr. Dewey Beagle, who was my Old Testament professor, which is why I still remember that in 621, Josiah began his Deuteronomic reform, Miss Betty Stillwell from Harmony United Methodist Church, all my friends and relatives who have gone before, who carried the faith, my husband, Richard Nelson Howington, who said when his diagnosis came through, I've had a very good life. If I get more, I will be thankful. If I get no more, I will still be thankful. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. People in the world today, even people in the church, are growing weary, growing weary of the pandemic. People have said to me, how could God allow these things to happen if there is a God? How could God allow these things to happen? And someone said to me once, prove that there is a God to me. And I said, I can't prove it, but there is a God. No, you can only believe what you can prove. And I said, does anyone love you? And they said, yes. I said, prove it. You can't prove love, can you? You can know it. You can experience it. You cannot prove it. Someone said, well, my wife is good to me. She brings me coffee every morning. I said, she could put strychnine in it for all you know. My parents are good to me. I said, they have to be legally. They've got to feed you, clothe you. They might not even like you. Trust me, some days they probably don't like you at all. We cannot prove but we can know. We can know. I know you struggle a little when I throw some new music at you. We're going to sing it again at the end. We've come this far by faith, leaning on the Lord, trusting in his holy word. He's never failed us yet. Oh, can't turn around. We've come this far by faith. Now, Bill gets to wrap it up with the great words from the Apostle Paul. Faith, hope, and love abide these three, and the greatest of these is love. But faith will abide if you abide in faith. So if you need a little faith, borrow some from your neighbor. If your neighbor needs a little faith, let them borrow some of yours. And go home this week, read this chapter again and again, make your own list of saints, or better yet, make the own, your own list of the times that God's faith has seen you through a bad storm. And if your boat is rocking now, remember Jesus Christ is sleeping right there with you. All you have to do is wake him up.
and he will calm your storm. Even the winds and the waves obey him. Amen. Amen.